Well, hello, hello again, and welcome to another Lunch and Learn session. As previously, I am still Vri Castellini, Seed and Sparks Film Community Manager. And before we get started, as always, we'd like to first acknowledge that the land that we are all on is occupied territory. Please check the YouTube live comments feed or the video description for a link to a First Nations COVID relief fund, as well as an amazing app that will tell you exactly whose land you're currently watching from. And if you're here but not as familiar with who the heck Seed and Spark is, uh, <clears throat> voice cracking, apparently I'm going through puberty today. Uh, Seed and Spark is a platform built to support creators by providing tools for wherever you are in your creative journey, whether that's crowdfunding and education all the way through to creative distribution approaches. So as always, we are super excited to welcome you to another session. Today, we have two incredible student filmmakers who crowdfunded their senior thesis projects with us. And we're gonna talk to them about film school, about what they hope comes next, about the projects they crowdfunded for and everything in between. So be sure to include questions that you have in the comments section throughout today's event. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's bring our panelists on and learn a little bit more about them. Hello, hello. Hey. Hi guys. <laughs> so, uh, so to get us started, how about you guys tell us uh, your name, your, a little bit about your film that you crowdfunded for and what film school you went to. So Laura, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, so my name is Laura. I'm from the Basque Country in Northern Spain. Um, and I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And I hey, <laughs> yeah, so the project um, that I crowdfunded for is called Lamia. It was my senior film thesis, and it's a story about a Basque mythological creature uh, struggling to preserve her power after a man steals her egg. Cool, and Kamari? Hey, I'm Kamari Bryant. I am from um, originally New Bern, North Carolina, but I currently live in Greensboro, and I go to UNC Greensboro. <laughs> and um, I am the director for Mothman, which is a project we're crowdfunding for right now. And Mothman is about a black student journalist named Ronnie Reed, who goes to school at a predominantly white institution and, you know, realizes that there's some, you know, rigging going on in the election. So decides to become a mass superhero Mothman and save the day. Very cool. So we've got some supernatural and actiony elements to both of these projects. I'm really excited to talk about it. So uh, let's let's take a step back first. Can you both tell me a little bit about why you decided to go to film school and, and study film in college? What led you down that path? Yeah, so I actually didn't know I was going to study film. Um, I attended Wesleyan, which is a liberal arts school. Um, and I just started taking different classes. I, I, I had done stop motion before, so I knew I was into video editing. Um, and then I, I also did theater in the past and creative writing. So I was unsure between theater, English and film. And then after uh, my first film class, um, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, we watched uh, the movie Street Angel, um, and I just fell in love with it. And not only that, but I just had never um, paid so much attention to films before. Um, after listening to uh, the, profes the professor uh, analyzing the film and just like every single detail of the lighting and the mise-en-scene uh, and the editing, I just, I had never paid so much attention to all those details before. Um, and I just fell in love with how, um, with, with, I felt in love with how detailed um, filmmaking was and how um, everything from the costumes to the lighting was telling the story. Cool, Kamari? Yeah, um, I actually study acting in school right now, um, but I've always been interested in how acting or theater in general, theater and film kind of have that, you know, there's like a blurred line in, in between it a little bit, you know, when I go to a school, a UNCG, like a huge university that has so many different, um, you know, so many different opportunities and so many different majors, which has been really cool because I get, I get to explore like the theater side of things, like the acting and the performance, but there's also like an amazing media studies department where I can also explore like filmmaking and like making a, a pro, like, you know, creating a process from the ground up and seeing how those two very different mediums how they very much are like have some of the same roots and how they, you know, they support each other in a lot of ways. Um, 
and like a lot of the a lot of the acting training that I do get you know supports how I see film like how how you know how um like the kind of lens that I look at film through so that's been kind of an interesting process kind of juggling both and you know seeing how both work hand in hand and side by side Cool. So what, what degrees did you both go after? Laura, you're graduated now, right? You're, you're done yeah. with school. So what, what degree did you get? Um, so I got a degree in uh, film, a major in film studies and a creative writing certificate too. Got it. And that's a mm -hmm. MA master or not, not MA, BA bachelor of arts degree. Yeah. Undergraduate. Got it. Perfect. And Kamari? Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm a BFA in acting major um, with a concentration in musical theater. Um, and I also okay. have a minor in media studies. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So a lot of variety in here. So now yeah. that you, so like Laura, you're through it already and Kamari, you're in your final year. Is there anything you wish you'd known before applying to film school? Anything that you wish you could have told your, you know, 17, 18 year old selves? Um, I just, I would have watched a lot more films before. Um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's just like such an incredible uh, long list of films that I still have not seen, um, and yeah, I just I I wish I had watched more films before go getting to college. That's that's it. But I also like I don't regret spending all the time I did in theater and creative writing uh, because that helped me in the way that I make film and the way that I do film as Kamara said, um, the, the, my acting experience has also helped me direct actors. So. Yeah. yeah and, um, yeah. And, um, I guess like for me, you know, before I can I, I went to college and you know, I was in high school, I always was like, you have to kind of choose between, you have to choose something. It's always like a choice for me. It's like, you have to choose between acting or, 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 you know, filmmaking, you have to choose between like theater and film as like, just like a, as a medium, you know? And I guess, I, I guess I wish I just know, would have known before that you don't have to make a choice. You know, I kind of learned, I kind of, you know, decided a little bit too late to like, you know, you can do both and you can do as many things as you want to do. Like you don't have to have just one, thing it can be all the things but you just got to know when where to put your put your time and your um and your commitment levels at certain times totally so um what is the plan after film school so like laura you're out of film school officially it's been a couple of months i assume uh and kamari you're you're staring down the barrel of being out of school <laughs> and obviously right now is a very bizarre time to be making plans for the future especially in the mm -hmm. arts but uh but i'm curious what you guys were hoping to use your degrees for um and and what that march forward looks like right now yeah um i mean i guess like the dream has always been to, you know, a, a, like one of the big cities, you know, like New York, LA, Atlanta, one of them. And like my heart has always been on New York because that's a place where you can get like your film and your theater. You can get it all, you know? So, um, I mean, I still would love to move to New York and, you know, we, I've got, we've got like this, the, the independent film company, we have independent productions, you know, continuing that on and continue, like moving that from Greensboro, North Carolina to like New York and kind of like trying to reach out and become bigger than what we are currently. That's definitely the dream. <laughs> What about you, Laura? Yeah, so um, my plan after before COVID was that after graduation, I was going to move out to LA and try to get in the film industry. Um, obviously, with COVID, <laughs> that <laughs> was late. So I ended up going back home um, for this summer. And I'm here until hopefully the world gets a little bit better and jobs start to appear. Um, so yeah, I'm just waiting, hoping to get to LA in a couple of months or so um, and try to give it a shot. Got it. Are either of you thinking about grad school? Not for now. Um, I'm hoping to start getting some more job experience. And then like, if I don't find a job in like six years, I'll consider grad school. <laughs> <laughs> six years, very specific. What about you, Karen? <laughs> Um, I mean, that's, I've always had like an eye out for grad school, you know, I've always wanted to go to grad school for film. Um, but I mean, it, I do, I would love to just like go out and work for a little bit, get some more experience under my belt and like, see how it is to, you know, work on like actual set, you know, <laughs> like, and then, and then like, I don't know, I don't know, you know, I guess that's always been a dream, you know, that's been a, 
a thought, but who knows? And it's not the current <laughs> plan. Yeah, it's not the current plan, exactly. Got it. Yeah, I will say uh, for all of you students that I know are watching right now and for you two as well, uh, for what it's worth. So I did sort of go to grad school for, for film. I have an MFA in writing and producing for television. And I also teach grad school. I'm an adjunct professor at two different uh, MFA programs um, for screenwriting and for television writing. And uh, what I would say if anyone out there is thinking about graduate school is don't go right away unless you're looking to teach because obviously mm -hmm. you do need an advanced degree to teach most places, uh, but especially if you wanna teach at like the college or graduate level. Um, and I would also remind yourself like, what is the goal of this program? And honestly, it's the same advice I'd give to anyone going to undergrad film school, but you know, undergrad is a, a little bit of a different situation, but for grad school, especially, if you're gonna take on the expense, if you're gonna take on the workload of a graduate program and you're not necessarily looking to teach, well, what are you looking out of it? Like, what are you mm -hmm. looking for? Are you looking to get better at a craft? So, you know, are you looking to get deeper into, you know, camera technology and cinematography and things like that? Are you looking to deepen your acting experience? Are you looking for networking opportunities, either with fellow students or with faculty? Are you looking for an alumni support network that you don't currently have? Like, those are the things and the reasons that I, I think that you should think about when approaching a graduate school or not graduate school sort of a, a conversation. Um, so yeah, definitely understand what the, your goals are for going mm -hmm. back um, before you make any decisions. That's just, it's just my two cents putting it out there. Uh, <laughs> but let's, let's move on from generally film school. Although again, if anyone has questions about film school um, that they want to drop in the comments, please feel free to, uh, but let's, let's move on to your project. So can you tell us a little bit more about your, your thesis films, what made you want to tell this story, you know, and, and what led up to making the decision like, yep, this is the big thing that I'm gonna do at the end. Yeah, so um, I can start if that's okay. Um, Please. So when, okay, so I knew for sure that I wanted to make a production film thesis, a short film. Um, Wesleyan offered other thesis options like uh, writing a script or um, doing like a history thesis. But like from my freshman year since I started um, taking film classes, I started making short films on my own and I knew that I wanted, I wanted to make a short film. Um, and also like in on, um, on uh, my third year at Wesleyan, um, there's a class where they teach you how to um, shoot on 16 millimeters and edit on 16 millimeters on like the old editing machines from the 50s and i fell in love with it um <laughs> so i really wanted to make a 16 millimeter short um and in terms of the story um i i'm really into fantasy so i knew right away i wanted to make a fantasy short um but i wasn't sure what the topic was going to be um and because I had been in the U.S. for uh, five years, and I'm from the Basque Country, which is um, it's a region in northern Spain that not many people know. Um, so, sort of based on my experiences as somebody from a minority culture in the U.S., um, I sort of thought, well, I could I could use this as a chance to promote Basque culture, and so um, I chose the myth of the Lamia because. Um, I thought it was sort of like a femme fatale in the way that uh, the way that it, it was understood um, in in the Basque Country. Generally, it was sort of like a Greek siren, and so I wanted to flip that story from a more feminist point of view, um, and and that's that's sort of how uh, how the story came to came to fruition. Very cool, Kamari. Um, yeah, for me, I guess um, Mothman, how it came about is it really just like a, it's like a it's like a response to the times that we live in, really. Like it was like looking at like looking at the state of where we are in the world and kind of like wanting to make something that was a reply to that. That was kind of like a, a encapsulated, you know, you know, thing that was like a mirror of our society today. Um, but we wanted to, you know, we wanted to make it so that it reflected. Um, like America specifically, but like on a college campus, because, you know, I feel like 
college a college campus is such a specific place that has so many different people from so many different cultures and like upbringings and you know it it has kind of like that demographic you know scale of what America is but like in a very condensed form you know and um and it's also just like I think a time where you know where it's it's a good time to uplift you know you know black voices and you know and that's what we wanted to make with a superhero that could kind of just you know be the be the the calling card for like for the revolution really you know like be out there as the forefront and say i'm not gonna do justice anymore i'm not gonna deal with you know pushing down our voices i'm gonna and be that face and <laughs> honestly it was like just like a lot of like doodling like this i love spider-man i love batman and i was like what is another oh moth mothman you know <laughs> so like mothman specifically came to be like the actual character but the the story formatted around it was really just you know a, a love letter to to the things that inspired me as a kid, which is just you know watching those black like black directed films from like the '90s, like Spike Lee, you know, like John Singleton, and and reading comic books, like watching Spider Man, the '90s animated series, you know, like watching all of these these things that inspired me, and I wanted to make a love letter to those things. So it really was like an amalgamation of all these things, all these thoughts that I've had for so long, and you know putting it out because it, it's a perfect time, I think, to have a, a person, a character, you know, represent these things that we're all feeling, but, you know, yeah. Got yeah. it. So so it sounds like both of you have like a very like personal connection to your, your film's topic, not just because like, this is my senior thesis project, but because it comes from like a very personal, like identity based place, which is very cool. So did you guys have, or do you have like, plans for the film beyond it, you know your your senior thesis project like what are what are you hoping to do with the thing that you're making because both of you made such bright and beautiful and interesting stuff and i you know i personally want to see more of it so do you guys have plans for your for your projects uh we're planning on you know putting it through the after we're finished with it and everything putting it through like the film festival circuit and everything see how that goes that's like the real big plan right now is you know submit to festivals, see how it goes. Yeah, that's like the dream is getting into like festivals and seeing it and seeing like, like having people see your your thing and like how they react to it. So that's definitely the the plan right now. Sure. Laura? Yeah, so in my case, um, the film is going through festivals for right now. Um, but for like long term, um, I was thinking of possibly adapting it to a feature script um, and then hoping to get that funded. But like, that's like very long-term with a lot of good luck. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and in the meantime, I'm also writing other scripts of like similar vein, sort of fantasy mixed with fast culture and mythology, so. Very cool. Maybe there's even a, a case for like an anthology short film series. Who knows? Um, so let's talk about, <laughs> yeah, right? I, I, honestly, I just want to see more of both of yours. Like, Kamari, yours very much seems like a series to me. Like, oh, I would, that, of would the, right? that would be the dream. Right? That would be the dream. I think I, I kind of picked that up. And and yeah, Lara, yeah. yours is so dreamy and cool. Like an anthology series or a feature would be so cool. So, so let's talk about funding. We did say that we were going to talk about crowdfunding for your thesis. So for both of you, what makes the decision to crowdfund instead of just you know sticking to the resources available at school i guess the 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 main conceit of mothman it was just like such a big idea and all, like in my head and everybody's heads it was like when i when we, when we wrote it and then we kind of like pitched it to the team we were like this is it and it was just big like it was like the ideas were big it was very flashy and like very like poppy and comic booky you know so we were like, what's the next step here? We gotta, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta raise the money somehow. Um, and we had, we've had experience raising money on uh, crowdfunding for uh, a previous project, but a way less amount than we were than we had planned to do for Mothman. So it's just kind of like it was kind of successful the last time we did it. Let's try it again and see if any, if any, you know, if anything comes of it. Where did you fundraise the first time? Uh, the first time we um, fundraised on GoFundMe. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And so, Laura, what about you? What made you decide to crowdfund? Yeah, so the main reason was that the film was on 16, and uh, 16 millimeter is a lot more expensive just because uh, not only buying the film, but also because we were doing everything traditionally. So I was sending it out to labs that would process it. Mm -hmm. um, 
getting a work print and then editing the work print and sending it to the negative cutter. Um, and so it was, it's an expensive process. Um, and I was lucky that uh, Wesleyan, the Wesleyan Film Department offered uh, financial aid, but it only covered half the cost. Um, so, and I, I, even with like some personal savings, I still didn't have enough. So it was like, okay. And, and I reached out to um, film majors before me uh, who did film thesis before me. Um, and I was like, what, what did you do? How did you raise money? And they told me they did crowdfunding uh, and they told me they recommended Scene and Spark to me. They said that overall from all the people that I reached out to, it was the, the platform that they were most happy with. Um, so it was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And it was my first time crowdfunding, so. Got it, okay, very cool. Um, yeah, th there was a period of time last fall, and I think you were the first of the wave where there, we had like 15 Wesleyan senior thesis films funding at the same time. Like every week I was like, I recognize that email address. I know where these people are from. So that was that was kind of a fun thing. And like, I kept seeing the same people in different videos. It was very fun to like track the Wesleyan film department across each other's projects for a while. Um, so we actually have a, a, a question before we get super deep in the crowd funding conversation, let's take a step back to the processes. We have a question from Jala on YouTube who asks, uh, who first, who says, love this discussion. So great job, everyone. We're doing a great job, everyone. <laughs> Round of applause for ourselves. Uh, Jala asks, when it comes to your writing process, what comes first, the story itself or a visual or concept? Hmm. That's a good question. Interesting. Um, I guess for me, when, when, a, when a story comes to me, it's always like, I guess, con very conceptual, you know, very like, uh, big picture, you know, you know, yeah, I think very much in the big picture. So it'll be like, like, for example, for Mothman, it was literally I was in an acting class. And <laughs> it was something it was a time where I should have been paying attention, but I wasn't. And I was just kind of doodling in my, you know, like I was doodling in my notebook. And, you know, I was trying to come up with like, character like a superhero, and it, it came to Mothman. And I was thinking, like, politics, like politics on a college campus, student government, it just kind of like comes in like little bits. And I see like scenes and like, I take the scenes and put an outline and then format it from that, you know? So I guess, yeah, very conceptual in a way. Yeah, um, I'm not sure in my case, I think it's like a little bit of both, um, but I think that I, like in this case, I started thinking of like, after I knew that I wanted to make the story of the Lamia, I started thinking of like special effects and like, um, yeah, I started thinking of like what like magical special effects I wanted her to make um, before I actually had the complete storyline. Um, I would say that my weakest point is like story structure in, <laughs> in screenwriting. So like I didn't have the, I was making changes to the script for like five months and I was working with, um, I had an advisor who like, like thanks to him, like the script got so much better. Um, but but yeah, and so because like I'm I'm very much like I I was thinking a lot about what the colors were gonna be. I was making like a, I I made a PowerPoint treatment where I just took a bunch of like uh, pictures from like like Pan's Labyrinth, and I just I love the colors in Pan's Labyrinth and like different like cave pictures from uh, from Google and different like, like so I was thinking of like the colors before the story. <laughs> and then after I, I wrote the first draft of the script, I started storyboarding. And then with my advisor, we started seeing what worked and did it work. Um, so yeah, cool. I, guess, I guess that's a long answer. <laughs> for <laughs> No, very interesting. Yeah, I, I have friends who also are very similar and like the sort of aesthetic of the thing is what comes to them first and then they kind of work backwards. I can't do that. I, I'm someone who I'll have a, a funny idea for a character and then figure out what it means later. Uh, so I wish I had your guys' brains because I'm not a very visual thinker. I come from <laughs> great prose writing and God help me, I need some, some more of your guys' brains. So I'm glad that you're both <laughs> continuing in the film industry, maybe. 
who knows? We'll work on something together later. Maybe you'll hire hey. me someday. Um, <laughs> so we have another question, but I think I'm gonna actually start our crowdfunding conversation in earnest, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to this question uh, as we go. So um, as you guys were preparing your crowdfunding campaigns, what was something that you were really nervous about as you like got up to launch? What was like the thing that you were most anxious about? Oh, definitely reaching out to people asking for money because <laughs> I that just feels so awkward to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean because I'm like I'm a low income student and like I was like I feel bad like asking people people for money. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and especially because like I was. Um, I decided to target the crowdfunding campaign to um, the US because like, I realized that I had two very different audiences for my film. One was a Basque audience who already knew what a Lamia was and already knew the mythology and a different audience, which was people in the US who had no idea what, <laughs> what Basque mythology was. Um, and so I thought it was very important to target the crowdfunding platform to a uh, campaign to one audience um and because like most of my uh family um preferred to just give me money in cash um <laughs> i decided okay well i'll do this campaign for the us for my friends in the us um and again like most of my friends are college students <laughs> and and so like i wasn't expecting um all the support that they gave me but like little by little you know if like one person gives you five bucks another person gives you five bucks it adds up um so so yeah that was i felt so awkward asking for <laughs> <laughs> Come on, um, what about you? i guess yeah i guess for me uh the the most kind of like uh scary kind of part leading up was just how much money we were trying to raise uh, I, for our last project, Libations, we were just trying to raise a thousand dollars, and that's like very little when you look like. It's, I mean, it's like in like it's comparison to what we were trying to raise for Mothman, it was like a, a way smaller amount. So it was way scarier to try to raise ten thousand five hundred dollars because, you know, that's that's just like so much money. Like I can't even wrap my head around that, honestly. You know, and and it was a scary kind of you know thing to ask of people like that's a big number for people to see like they click on the your, they click on your link they like see your your pitch and everything and they see like ten thousand five hundred dollars like <laughs> i don't want to be like run people away so that was kind of like the the scary part you know first like just straight out yeah so we actually have a great question that kind of leads into what we're talking about from Ale on YouTube who asks, how did you go about uh, sharing your crowdfunding link? Like what were some of the actions? Did you ask people personally, share on social media, send emails? Like what, what was the outreach strategy that you used that was the most successful for your project? Uh, the most successful for us, I would definitely say would be like personal messages, like on all platforms. like. It was a lot of personal emails, a lot of Facebook messages, messages, a lot of Instagram DMs, <laughs> like, you know, a lot of like sending the link directly to people. So like they had to either look at it or like <laughs> or ignore it. Like it was, you know, kind of putting it in their face a little bit, which seemed, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. I felt very annoying. Like we all felt extremely annoying and kind of patronizing a little bit, but like, you know, a lot of people like, prefer that kind of method they prefer like having it directly to them because it gets like uh, you know links can get lost in news feeds and like algorithms and everything and yeah yeah it was same for me um i did a combination of um, messaging group chats and private message and found that private messaging worked best um <laughs> Yeah, because in group chats, there's just like a diffusion of responsibility where like people, they, people are more used to like receiving spam messages or like long messages that, and and I do it too. Like sometimes you don't even read read everything because there's just so many messages. They, there can be so many messages on one group chat. Um, and then I also did one. Uh, I created a Facebook page for the film. Uh, which was also helpful because I could invite all my friends to like it and then I could post updates there of like how the crowdfunding uh, campaign was going. Um, 
so that was another way to get followers. Um, and then something else I did was, uh, this was before I started the campaign, um, I started um, translating Basque myths to English um, because a lot of these myths are so hidden. They're, most of them are bare, like very few of them are translated to Spanish, um, like even fewer to English. So I was like, since I'm doing all this research, might as well make it available to people. Um, so um, I, tra I translated 20 Basque myths and I created like a email newsletter. And I basically just like asked a bunch of people like, hey, like um, I'm sending out myths. <laughs> would you be interested in receiving them? And all the people that told me, yes, um, I created like an email newsletter. Um, and so that was also another way to promote the campaign because when the campaign came out, when I would, I would send out one myth every two weeks so I wouldn't spam people <laughs> every week. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it was like one, one page myth every two weeks and with it i would send a very short email and i would say hey this this month we also started crowdfunding if you're interested you can click on this in spark link um and yeah so that was another strategy that i used so we love that strategy so much, Laura. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, it was an example in last week's Lunch and Learn all about great crowdfunding incentives because like the principles of a great crowdfunding incentives uh, and Kamari has heard me say this to him and his team uh, many times <laughs> is making something really visual, which like any kind of writing kind of inherently is visual, uh, something shareable. So, you know, you can easily forward a newsletter to people um, instant. It's something that just goes directly to their inbox. You don't need their address or anything. They don't have to wait for shipping um, and mm -hmm. personal and on brand. And obviously it's extremely on brand for your project. So that was such a smart use of audience building and how it kind of is contained in crowdfunding. So I was really impressed with that. And Kamara, you guys have been doing a lot of really fun stuff in similar ways. I mean, your visuals and like the the practice sketches for like what your superhero <laughs> looks like, like all of that kind of stuff is so perfect because you guys are the only ones who can be offering that kind of content. And that really sets the stage for, oh, these students aren't just students, they are serious artists and they are invested in this story. So that's really, really uh, awesome. And so Ale, the other thing that I would say that has been echoed by our two panelists is that direct outreach is where it's at because exactly like Laura said, the diffusion of responsibility, the bystander effect that happens when you make things too broad means that everyone is gonna be like, well, I'm sure somebody else will take care of it. I'll like the tweet and maybe they'll think that I can, you know, contributed, but we all know <laughs> that they didn't contribute. I know you just liked the tweet and moved on with your day. But when you make it personal, <laughs> even with just lightly personalizing it, it makes people feel special, you know? And like, think about when you're being targeted by a crowdfunding campaign, if they make it really general and it has nothing to do with you and you haven't heard from this person in years and they don't even say hi to you, like, <laughs> are you interested in giving them money? Probably not. The other thing I would say that kind of speaks to um, what Laura was kind of anxious about ahead of her campaign, which is echoed by everyone, the awkwardness of asking for money, is try not to think of it that way. Try not to think of it as asking for money. Think of it as asking people to get excited about this thing that you're obsessed with. Both of you are obsessed with your concepts and you have such a deep like reason to make them aesthetically and personally. And so get people excited about that and have a great page for people to visit once they also get excited. And from there, they can decide how excited they are. And that I think in some cases makes it a lot less uncomfortable than saying, hey, do you have $5? But saying, hey, you wanna hear about this really cool thing I'm working on. That helps a little bit. So any students who are out there feeling a little, you know, uncomfortable about the whole thing, try to reframe in your mind the point of this because ideally you're, this isn't the only film you're gonna make. Ideally, this is the beginning of something. So don't start by having a transaction with someone. Start by just getting mm -hmm. them excited about what you're working on. And from there, they will follow you wherever you go. So there's a lot of power in the excitement of a crowdfunding campaign and all that it promises, not just the money part. We can be excited about the money part quietly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as you guys are, are going through your crowdfunding campaign, uh, is there something you learned along the way that either you didn't expect to or mm -hmm. that totally changed the way that you thought about crowdfunding and audience building in general? Yeah, well, I wanted to add to what you said in terms of that, like, 
yes, at first I was feeling really awkward about like <laughs> messaging people. Uh, but then like I realized what you're just talking about, which is like, why am I making this project? Um, and like in seeing how excited other people were about Basque myths and about the project, I also got more excited about it too. Um, and I learned that I, I, I knew why I wasn't making why I was making the project, but I sort of like like enforced this idea in my mind even more um, that I was making this to promote Basque culture and and even like by seeing how how excited people were, I even did more things to promote Basque culture. Like I posted more things on so social media about like not just related to the film but also things unrelated to the film, but uh, related to past culture or mythology that I found on the internet. Um, also like a crew member um, from Lamia um, reached out to me after reading the Basque myths and he was like, hey, like, do you think I could make these into audiobooks? And he made three Basque myths into audiobooks. And that's so were cool. <laughs> I was so excited to see them up on YouTube and yeah, they were awesome, so. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that's something that you learned is, hey, when you get excited, sometimes people wanna work with you and do cool stuff with you. Um, but yeah, what, what other things did you learn through the process of crowdfunding that maybe you would take into your next campaign or your next marketing or your next film? Um, I would say I definitely learned that kind of like what, what Laura was saying about how people, I, I just feel like people, a lot more people will believe in your story than you give yourself credit for. And that like a lot of like people will want to be excited about what, you, what you're what you doing, you know? And kind of like, like kind of what you're saying as well, like look, like going at it as, as more of like, let me share this with you versus, versus- um, Give me hey, something. I have some money. Yeah, <laughs> give yeah. me money, you know? It's like, it's like people will believe in you if you, if you can just clearly and concisely tell tell what you're passionate about and like because the passion is going to be there if you really believe in something that you want to do you know so just like being able to concisely and like very like in a, in a nice little way say like this is what this is i love it maybe you'll love it too you know i think that has helped a lot in this process for crowdfunding is just the way the way to attack it like the way to go about it you know yeah anything to add laura Anything um, you learned? No, I think you put it in a very nice way. <laughs> <laughs> I also think it's worth mentioning because I, you know, I, I'm watching all these students come through in, in chat that like you don't figure this out right away. You don't figure this out day one. You know, sometimes it takes learning from your crowd a little bit to learn how to crowdfund properly. And certainly, you know, not everyone is great at summarizing their work. I, I'm. I would count myself amongst them, you know, people who, <laughs> what is this about? Like, well, do you have two hours? Because no. I, I have a lot to unpack. <laughs> exactly. Um, a only a little bit of hyperbole, but like lean on each other, you know, lean on fellow students. One of the, the most fun parts of watching the, you know, entire Wesleyan student body crowdfund for a couple of months was watching them help each other out, watching somebody who was like the writer director of their film sign on as a producer or a DP for someone else's film. And I know how much better that I get at my work and my crowdfunding when I lean on people around me and say, hey, can I bounce some ideas off of you? Can you help me figure out what the hell I'm trying to say in less than two hours? So don't be afraid to ask for help. I know that that was something that I struggled with and a lot of my, my fellow students struggled with when I was still in school and asking for help is not a weakness. It does not mean that you can't figure it out. It doesn't mean that you're not ready for the real world. It actually means that you're more ready for the real world because the, you know, especially in filmmaking, it's such a collaborative process. So let it be collaborative. And even if somebody doesn't end up working on the film with you, there's tons of people around you who I'm sure would love to bounce ideas off of you and, and help you get to the core of what is so exciting about the film that you're making. Uh oh, I think we lost Kamari. He's been having some issues with his internet, so I'm sure he'll be back soon. Um, so, uh, to, while, while we're waiting for Kamari to come back, we have a great question from Danny Thomas, who, uh, spoiler alert, works at Seed and Spark, but is also just a, an awesome creator herself. Uh, both of your projects have such integrity in terms of what you wanted to accomplish culturally by making them. Have you considered bringing those to the socio political conversation beyond your class? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, in my case, um, 
it was like promoting bass culture has been um like some, something i've been working on for for since i was in the us pretty much um oh, you're back <laughs> welcome yeah. back <laughs> thank you um, so let's yeah. continue so yeah i mean wherever i go like i've i've been making like the first year i was in the us um i was in this um change program and i was making like um like talks about bass culture so like i definitely want to keep making those um and but not only that i've also i also want to like promote um the film in the bass country um whenever COVID, <laughs> um all this world gets back to place i would love to like screen it for free um and just talk to students um in like schools um bring it to like high schools and elementary schools and show it to people um which is eventually what i um what i make this project for um and yeah, I think I, I love seeing how um, this project sparks conversation and like there has been some like friends, uh, Basque friends who have told me, wow, like it's amazing how you've um, managed to like flip the the role of the Lamia into a more feminist character. And I was like, yes, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I love hearing that for, from people. So I, I love seeing how it sparks conversation. That's so cool. Kamari, uh, questions at the bottom of the screen for you if you wanted to weigh in about the sort of uh, cultural integrity behind your project and, and if you're considering bringing that and that the, the sort of ideology behind your work to, con you know, a sociopolitical conversation beyond class. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think, yeah, innately, I think Mothman is a very like political story and, you know, it, it has a lot of conversations about politics and, and how we kind of look at politics in in America specifically, you know? And I think that um, I think that especially with this being like an election year, it's very important because it's it's about this character who who wants who who wants to do things the right way. He wants to do things by the by the book, but realizes that sometimes the right way or what it, what seems the right way is not the right way. And realizes that there are other ways to use your voice than just um, like when 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 some parties begin begin to use use their powers to uh, mess with things, you have to, you have to use your voice in other ways to uh, to get what you want. So I think yeah, innately it's a very very political film, and I think that um, the conversations that are that we're having in Mothman, you know, I think you know we would come up and have them as you know conversations as just just outside of the film as well, you know, continuing that that push of of you know how to make even when it's not an election year, you know, how do you, how do you make your voice loud when it's, when it's not just, you know, November every four years, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Your, your project is definitely one of those, like just ultimately uber ta like timely pieces. I was like, wow, I can't believe that this is the time that this project is crowdfunding. Like <laughs> maybe it was, it was meant to be in, in some right? ways. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, hey, art art has an important role in changing culture. Art tells us what's important, right? You know, when you see something represented on screen, like that's what we just assume is important. And so when we put stories with a more like, what's the word? A, a, not just powerful vision, but but stories with things that we don't see very often, we realize, oh, right, more things are important than, you know, five white guys trading off who's in charge of different shows. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing what yeah, happens yeah. when we see more than those five white guys talking about, I don't know, they're being lawyers or whatever they all do, or being SWAT team members, you know, the things that white guys do. <laughs> you know how it goes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce back to a question from a count named WA Media. Uh, they are currently in development for their grad thesis film and preparing a crowdfunding campaign. So his the questions are, uh, have you used other methods besides crowdfunding to find money or materials? Like, did you take loans? Like, were there in-kind things? Yeah, um, so do you want to go? <laughs> you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so I uh, had some like 
of my personal savings, as I mentioned before, um, Wesley in the Wesleyan Film Department um, offered financial aid that covered half the cost of the film. Um, but then besides that, what, um, and this was um, an idea that uh, a, a film major who, was, um, who did a thesis before me told me is um, he uh, sold uh, food during homecoming uh, during like a the, like a bake sale kind of a thing, like just out in the quad. Yeah, just like out next to the football game, <laughs> where like which is like and like on homecoming, like all the parents and family comes to Wesleyan, and and so I was like, okay, uh, but instead of cookies, I'm gonna make some traditional Basque food. <laughs> and still on brand. Honestly, your commitment <laughs> to your brand is so inspiring yeah, and so fun. Just that's so funny. It was. It was. It was really funny. <laughs> I was also like, I was wearing the duck feet from the film. <laughs> I was wearing like traditional <laughs> Basque clothes. Like now, like now that I think back on it, I was like, oh my god, it was so ridiculous. But it was fun. <laughs> Uh, do you remember how much money you raised from that? Um, let me uh, maybe like maybe like a hundred bucks. <laughs> hey, still, like, that that buys lunch for you know a day or two, depending on how big your yeah. cast is. Yeah, and, truly. And like, and I wasn't there for a long time. I was probably selling them for like three hours only. So yeah, so and it was a lot of fun, and also like not only like it, it wasn't only to raise money but i also learned a lot about like how to pitch the project to other people <laughs> that just yeah. walked by Practice makes perfect <laughs> yeah um and like i learned like what worked best and what didn't work like for example like I had signs of like support a student film <laughs> it, was, it was really funny um but and so i i learned that like rather than um similar to what we mentioned before of like like um what you have to offer like instead of being like instead of approaching people saying uh, do you want to help a student film i found that what worked best was approaching people saying hey um do you know what the basque country is or are you interested in mythology or are you in a fantasy and just starting talking to people about and and trying to find out what they liked um so then see what we had in common um and that way i i i met a lot of wonderful people and had great conversations um did, did you have a way to like capture their email addresses or anything so that you could follow up with them yeah, even after they yeah, got so a treat? I, I also had i i had uh two pieces of paper <laughs> and in one of them i wrote um uh, like if you're interested in learning more of the making of the film Give your email here, and then on the other piece of paper was uh, if you're interested in receiving the miss, put your email here. And so at the end of the uh, of talking to them, I would tell them, hey, like if you're interested in either one of these options, you can put your email, and I can send you the info. So, so yeah, and I, I got a lot of emails that way. It probably got like thirty to forty emails that way. That's amazing. And that, that's 30 to 40 more emails that you can send out the next time that you crowdfund for something, whether it's yeah. the Lamia feature or, you know, another short film. That's very yeah. cool. Kamari, what about you guys? Um, yeah, we actually, this time, I think we've, we've been completely uh, getting our funds for this film through crowdfunding, which has been really nice. Um, we tried to apply to a lot of grants. We didn't really get any, obviously. So, but. Grants are hard for narrative stuff, especially like kind of comedy action narrative stuff. That, yeah. that, that's not really what the grant landscape is looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So crowdfunding was our, our best bet, yeah. Uh, and WA Media had a follow-up question that we can answer really quickly. I think they were asking, how long did you crowdfund for? You both did 30-day campaigns, am I right? Yeah. I yeah, think so, yeah. Yeah, I and we generally recommend 30 day campaigns for most people because it is enough time to get the word out. You know, you're not feeling super rushed, but it's not so much time that you kind of languish and like mm -hmm. lose steam halfway through. It's kind of a nice like four week process. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do, I it's think been like a perfect, are, yeah, mm -hmm, it's been like a perfect amount of time. 
yeah, to, to crowdfund for longer. Like they're like, well, 60 days means that I have twice as much time to convince people. But what that also means is you need, you have twice as much time that you need to be like consistently putting out new information. You know, you can't just be saying, hey, I'm crowdfunding for 60 days in a row and have people continue paying attention to you day 59 as they were day one. So um, it's shorter is actually better. And I think you can probably both attest to uh, once you're in it, 30 days seems like a million years and you just wish it was over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. also, like, more, like in my experience, most people donated money at the very end of the campaign because, like, there's something about the immediacy of like somebody seeing, like, oh, like my friend is crowdfunding and it's ending in three days, <laughs> you know. And if I don't help her, it's yeah. gonna end, you know. There's something about that immediacy that I feel like if you have 60 days and like i if if i was seeing like the same type of messages from the friend for 60 days by like the last days i would probably be tired <laughs> Yeah, 30 days is like not enough time to get super annoying, especially if you have like a new thing to say, like a new incentive to add in week two mm -hmm. or three or, you know, a cast interview or a new Basque Myth newsletter coming out, something like that. So, you know, maintaining momentum is just having new things to say. And the longer you crowdfund for, the more new things you'll need to have to say. And that can be a lot of pressure, especially if you're also in school. So definitely I would recommend to any students out there, 30 days is a good amount of time for sure. Um, and, and yeah, Laura is totally right. We, we have stats where most co campaign contributions come in the first week and the last three days. So the longer <laughs> there is between those two periods of time, uh, the worse it is for you personally, like just on a mental health level, it sucks being in week two of a crowdfunding campaign, even if you're going, it's going really, really well. So don't make week two, four weeks long. Like, don't do that to yourselves. <laughs> Uh, so we got a question from Shabnam who says they are working on a hybrid doc for their thesis film. I'm looking for post-production funding to complete my film in a timely manner. Is crowdfunding a good way to move forward in your opinion? I think for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that certainly, yeah, I think that certainly would be a, a great avenue to go down as crowdfunding to get that. Toronto post-production can be expensive. <laughs> There's like a lot of stuff that goes into it. And I mean, from my experience with Spark for like for getting funds for production. I mean, I think that, yeah, they can help in any, in any sort of like capacity, so for sure. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is just like tell your audience um, like the different, like, the, cause like a lot of people don't know like why post-production can be so expensive. Um, and so just say like, it, like sound design is like, 60 or 30 percent of the cost color correction just break yeah. it down Here's and make sure list. that what the wish list remember of for seed and spark you can actually put down like what money is going to what thing so yeah definitely mm -hmm. co-signing that advice Do tell people what the money is for and mm -hmm. even better yet i would say is show people um we had a, a pitch video from a couple of a couple of months ago now, I think, who was crowdfunding for partially for post-production. And what they did in their pitch video is showed like before and after for like sound design. Mm. So like what it sounds like before, what it sounds like after and like color correction and better camera work and things like that. So if you can show people how much better a thing can be that's already really exciting with a little mm. bit more money thrown at it, like that could be a really powerful thing, you know, show, don't tell. Yeah. And also worth mentioning, like you're gonna need to start promoting the film at some point to get people to watch it. And crowdfunding done best is, is audience building first. So you're not only building your budget, but you're also building the number of people that you can reach out to once the film is ready to be seen. You know, you don't wanna just make the film and have no one ever watch it. So <laughs> you use crowdfunding as the opportunity to get people hyped up so that by the time it comes out, there's like a dedicated already group of people who are gonna be there day one to actually get to enjoy the experience with you. So, you know, I would, I would especially if, for, if you're thinking of crowdfunding at any point, post-production is sort of your last point and it's the closest you're going to be to actually releasing the film so people don't have to wait as long so that, yeah. that might be a really good thing to to think about cool 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 all right so that's the that's the last of audience questions so far so guys we have five minutes left so anyone in the audience who has final questions
questions, please, uh, please ask them here. Um, but uh, I have a couple other questions just because we have a little bit of time. Um, what would you advise other film students to do to make their own crowdfunding campaigns worthwhile? Is, is a question that I have. So like not just a soul sucking experience that is awkward <laughs> for everyone, but like what would you advise others specifically students do to make sure that like this isn't just a, a one-stop shop, this actually can benefit you moving forward? Um, I think for sure, I mean, just like thinking about, about it from a student perspective is like, I think you should get your campus involved. You know, I think like you have so many people on a campus, like it's, you like our campus is, is really big, you know, and, and there's so many different people from so many, so many different backgrounds and majors. It's like, there's, there's, there's like so many people to like get, get interested, you know, and they're also like peers, they're your, they're fellow students. So they should they have this kind of understanding with you. It's like, yeah, I'll help you, you know, you know, it's kind of like this like mutual kind of respect for each other in that way. So, you know, hang posters up. We like have this thing called the rock at our school, which is like a big rock. That's like a, people paint it over it, paint over it and, you know, pit messages. We put, you know, Mothman, Seed and Spark on the rock, you know, and like wrote chalk on the sidewalks and, you know, everything because that's, people are going to be walking and they see something and it's like, hey, I want to look into that, you know? So I think for sure that's a, a good method for for spreading your message. Yeah, I would say use this as a chance to learn. Um, and I said, because for me, like it was the first time that I did crowdfunding. Um, and the first time that I sort of like put myself out there. Um, so I learned a lot in terms of like, like marketing skills and like pitching and that overall, like it's helpful when you're doing job interviews or, you know, um, or, or just when you when you're trying to build an audience for your film. So of course, like you want to learn how to do that if you want to get into filmmaking. Um, so yeah, just use this as a chance to learn and enjoy the process. Yeah, and the more that you talk about why you love the film and not how much money you have left to raise, you'll enjoy the process a lot more. <laughs> Take it from the three of us. Like, <laughs> make it fun for yourself, and it'll be fun for other people. Uh, for sure. So. It looks like we're kind of at the end, and I think we've answered all questions. So thanks so much. So, uh, other than the, the the things scrolling at the bottom of the screen, where can we find you guys to to follow your work and your projects? Yeah, um, for sure. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kamari at Kamari TV, and Identity Productions like at the scrolling bar as well. Yeah, and <laughs> uh, help. Fund Mothman, which has like two yeah, days left yeah. in funding. We threw the the uh, link in chat, but we'll we'll throw it in again. They've got two or three more days, so if you want to be yeah. a part of this, uh, whether it's one dollars, whether it's a thousand dollars, hey, get in there. Hey. <laughs> and, and Laura, what about you? How can how can we find more about your work? Um, yeah, there, so we'll always do Instagram. Instagram. Sorry, what do you say? And and is there a public place where people can sign up for your newsletter? Would you consider doing that again for people who might be interested? After oh, yeah, I can, I can send the myths again if anybody's interested <laughs> in receiving them. <laughs> um, yeah, so below is like the, the Instagram, right? Um, so there's also the Facebook page. It's called Lamia Film Thesis. Um, and then you can, if you want to receive the newsletter, you can email me at, um, at Lamia Film um so like sorry um let me film gmail.com <laughs> <laughs> got it we'll we'll put that in the video description for anyone who's uh who's interested in in receiving those uh so any any final words of wisdom things to share from either of you um i guess like would love to like shout out my the, the team behind the behind mothman as well my co Founders and Identity Productions, Cameron Lindley, Michael Newman, Andrew Spies, and Randall Simmons. They've helped a lot with this process and they're equally in there as much as, much as I am. So I just want to shout them out real quick. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I just wanted to thank like not only the people who supported uh, my project, but just the people who, who spread the word and shared it with other people and were really excited about it. And again, like my crew, um, like my my family, my thesis advisor, um, everybody who helped make this film happen, um, and yeah, and thank you so much for for 
for supporting. Um, see, in my experience, like Seed and Spark has been a great experience uh, because, um, like, you just support, like, you guys support the filmmakers so much, and you help us um, spread the word about our films. So. Yeah. Well, that's that's what we're here for. Exactly. It feels like you're making a community of filmmakers, and it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like yeah. Community. Well, thank you. For and that. our and our lunch and learn community has has been a, a great way to continue that. So we were so excited to have both of you on today. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Best of luck in your final couple of days, Kamari, <laughs> Laura. Congratulations on on your your starting your festival run and all of that good stuff. We cannot wait to see what you guys do next. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us. Yeah. All right. And so for everyone else, thanks again for tuning in. As a reminder, if you are able and found this event um, valuable, we would love your support to continue bringing you these awesome free educational events. You can check out the link in the video description uh, as well as in the YouTube comments live stream, YouTube, YouTube live comments stream. Those four words are in some kind of order, and I think you got it. But uh, we have a little pay what you can uh, if you wanted to, you know, tip us for the great educational work that we're able to bring you. Uh, and if you like these events and want to attend the next ones, well, you are in luck because we've got a bunch of new ones coming up. So uh, first up is next week's Lunch and Learn, which is going to be a little bit more of a kind of casual AMA, Ask Me Anything About Crowdfunding, which will feature me in a much more depressing background, but still educational, don't worry. So me and Christina Rea, our head of education, will be doing a crowdfunding AMA next Wednesday, same time, same place as today. So we hope to see you there for all your burning crowdfunding questions. And on uh, Friday, September 19th, We've got another awesome creative sustainability session for you, which will be on the topic of narrative as resistance with Fanshin Cox Di Giovanni, which uh, is actually kind of similar to what we talked about today, you know, culturally aware, politically powerful art and then how to change the world with the, the stories that we tell. So we hope to see you at those. We thank you for seeing you here today and uh, we will see you soon.